Well, we continue our series, We Call Ourselves Disciples. Who is this church that we're a part of? Where did it come from? Where is it going? What do we believe? Can you believe anything you want and be a disciple? Told you I'd give you some fun facts along the way. Last week we talked about Lyndon Johnson, who was a disciple. And this week, on the other end of the political spectrum, Ronald Reagan was a disciple. Ronald Reagan went to Eureka College in Eureka, Illinois, which is a tiny little college, usually 500 to 1,000 students. It's one of the 15 colleges and universities that we started that are still around, including the one 20 minutes from here that should have won the football game last night, but <laughs> threw away the football game. We have four seminaries that are part of our movement. One of the hallmarks of the movement has been unity, not uniformity. Unity, not uniformity, which is what we're going to talk about today. Will you pray with me? God, among the words that are spoken, we pray that your word will be spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. Every family has those stories. The ones that you tell new people that come into your family or the ones you avoid telling the new people that come into your family. They're the stories that define the people that you call family. The way your family made it out west or came over on the Mayflower or made their way, conquered the world. Those stories, you know them and your folks have them. Here's one of mine. Most of you know I'm from a little farming community in southern Iowa. My grandparents were not yet married. They eloped, which was scandalous for that day. They left Iowa for Colorado to make their fortunes out west. They found a minister on the way to marry them so that by the time they got to Colorado, they were married. They were going to make their fortune after World War II. My Grandpa had run the farm until his brothers got back, and then it was his turn to go and have an adventure. And so they went, and before they left, they gave his brother, whose name was Loyal, his dog. He had just bought a puppy. It wasn't just any puppy. It was a full-bred bird dog. Okay, so up north you hunt pheasant and turkey, and you raise a dog and you train a dog for years to accompany you on those shoots. It takes at least two years, sometimes three, to properly train a bird dog. And my uncle kept the dog and trained it up and taught it how to be a bird dog and how to retrieve. And there's a bond that grows between a hunter and their dog. There's a connection that forms. It's like a canine officer and a canine dog because it takes so long to train it. And they learn your mannerisms and your voice commands, and they learn to walk beside you and retrieve only when they're told. And it's a lot of work to train a bird dog. So Grandpa got a letter in the mail one day that asked him to come back and run the farm. His dad was sick, and so the oldest son did his duty, and he returned from Denver. They never made their fortune, by the way. But they returned and they took over the farm because in that day that's what the oldest son did. And so he went to his brother Loyal and he said, I'd like to have my dog back. And his brother Loyal said, that's not your dog, that's my dog. I've fed it, I've kept it healthy, I trained it for two, three years. It listens to the command of my voice. It's not your dog my dog. So as you can imagine, a very calm argument ensued. <laughs> Words were exchanged. And my grandpa never talked to his brother again. They went to their graves estranged over a dog. They lived 20 miles apart. I have never met my cousins on that side of the family my aunts and uncles, over a dog. 
Think about the time that they lost, the love that they lost, the life that they lost, the things that they missed about each other's lives, their children's baptisms, weddings, baby dedications, illness, funerals, caring for one another, the mundane, boring stuff of life and the highs and lows of life, the stuff you do with your family, they missed it all. I never met my great-grandmother, but I can imagine now as a mother how that must have torn at her heart, at her very spirit, for her to pass on, knowing that her sons would never speak again. Her grandchildren never played on the floor together. There are no family portraits of that extended family, no Christmas dinners. How it must have torn her heart out that her sons were estranged. Why do I tell you this odd story about a bird dog from southern Iowa that lived in the 40s? I really believe the differences and the divisions in the church tear at the heart of God as if we are fighting over something as silly as a dog. The way we put other brothers and sisters of Christ down, the way we hold tight to the truth, the way that we proclaim there's only one way to follow God, only one way to read that verse, there's only one way to do church, and it's our way. When we do that, we tear at the heart of our God. Our movement started to restore the unity of the church. Or another way to put it is to put the family of God back together. To heal old divides and doctrines and differences and restore the faith. The one that Paul talked about. There is one faith, one Lord, one baptism that is in all and above all. The movement was to convince people that the ways we live out our faith, the things that we emphasize, the ways that we serve God, the ways that we worship should not divide us. Alexander Campbell, one of our founders, said our bond of union is not opinion nor unity of opinion. It is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He said about people that like to fight in the church. We don't ask people to give up their opinions when they join us. We ask them not to impose them upon others. Let them hold their opinions, but let them hold, let them hold those opinions as one would hold private property. This is one of the fav my favorite things he said. He said, believing in the gospel unites us in Christ. And it's the basis of our unity and our fellowship. The apostles' teaching is our curriculum that we study once we're enrolled in Christ's school. In that school, we are in different grades, and we can and will differ in understanding. But we're all part of the same school. He was quoting Augustine when he said, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. How many of you have heard that one before? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. And they, one of the things they talked about in the movement is that our list of essentials has gotten too big. And that's what divides us. And so they came up with their own list. That we baptize, believer's baptism is we, what we call it. So we don't baptize babies. We have no baptismal font. We have a baptistry. And we baptize people when they're ready to take the steps of faith. He said one of our essentials is our communion. That it's open to all. That all are invited to partake. Anybody who comes into the room to worship with us who's trying to follow Jesus is invited to the table. He said that we have to read this. <laughs> we have to know this. It's not a paperweight. It's our holy scriptures. It's our guidebook for the path of faith that we read it for ourselves, but not by ourselves. We read scripture for ourselves, but not by ourselves. Because once in a while, when we read it together, 
we discover that we have missed something and that our brother or our sister, our sibling in the faith has something to teach us. He said we have to have a priesthood of all believers, that the pastor doesn't get to call all the shots. Thank goodness. That every Christian is invited to serve and lead in the church. That we have a simple confession of faith, simple words to join our community, that we're about justice and making the world better than when it was handed to us. And above all, love. Has anybody ever been bowling with a child? And when you've been bowling with a child, have you asked the bowling alley to put out the bumpers? Right? Bumper bowling. Think of the essentials as our bumpers. Back in the old days, they had to actually roll them out. But now the computer tells you when they go in and when they go out. The essentials of our movement, baptism, communion, reading the Bible for ourselves, the priesthood of all, our confession, our move to work for good in the world, those are our bumpers. And you know when you've bowled with a little one, the ball may barely make it down to the pins, right? You're praying that you don't have to walk along the side to push the ball or send another one down. And if it has those bumpers, it zigzags back and forth. But eventually, it makes it. That lane is our life together as Christians. And our essentials are our bumpers. They keep us on the lane. They keep us together. They keep us united. And there's room to meander. There's room to maneuver. But the bumpers keep us together on our path toward following Christ. Think of love as the ultimate bumper, that if our community doesn't have love, it doesn't have anything. Love is the bumper. Love is the lane. Love is the journey. One of Paul's most essential teachings was the teaching of unity. And he gives us some bumpers in this passage of Scripture. I was talking to somebody this morning who said, I don't like Paul. (laughs) Well, I do and I don't. Paul challenges me. And in this Scripture, he's challenging us. He's giving us a path down the lane. He tells us about humility and gentleness. When you talk to another Christian, do you assume you have something to learn from them? Or do you come at a posture of trying to teach them your truth? Do you assume they have truth to teach you? Or you only have truth to teach them? Are you gentle in your approach with other Christians? Are you gentle with another person's faith? Do you look at it like a treasured object that if you drop it, it will break? Are you kind-hearted and gentle with other people's faith? Are you patient with other Christians? Are you patient with Christians who are on a different part of the journey than you are? The ones that have doubts you already solved or questions you already answered. Are you patient with other believers? And do you bear one another in love? Do you know what it's like to bear a family member? (laughs) Don't answer that. We all have family members that we don't like from time to time, but we love them. Even when we have to bear with each other as the body of Christ, we're called to do it in love. Love first, love second, love always. And finally, Paul says, share a bond of peace. May there be peace between us, between us and the Christians next door, between us and the Christians down the street. May we walk a path of unity using the essentials to keep us on the lane. Will you pray with me? God, we know it pleases you and your heart when we work for unity. Help us to always remember we are one body with one Lord and one God. Let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.